The great German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche has a very interesting idea about the origins of language. For Nietzsche, we're living in a world of constant change. At all times, we're caught in a torrent of feelings, sensations, and fears. And so, humans develop language, which is a way of superimposing stasis onto something that is in flux. For Nietzsche, this is a misrepresentation of reality, because while a person or an apple is constantly changing, the name David or apple superimposes an illusion of stability and permanence onto such things. David is aging and changing, the apple is imperceptibly decomposing, and yet the words David and apple let us work with a disembodied David, a non-organic apple. As such, for Nietzsche, language lies. It misrepresents reality by fixing it in time. But this convenient fiction, as he calls it, has a purpose, because it allows us to assess and analyze the flux of actual life, and to gain some form of control over it. This, for Nietzsche, is the basis for metaphysics, wherein we, as he says, take the real world off its hinges and instead work with a static world, which we can survive in and gain some control over. This, for Nietzsche, is a malign process, born of a resentment against life. It leads to all forms of metaphysics like mathematics, Platonism, or Christianity, all of which for Nietzsche are sinister attempts to gain control over the flux, chaos, and dynamism of organic life rather than being part of it. Here, as in general, I think Nietzsche is very brilliant, but also, as is often the case, very wrong. I think he's right about life being overwhelmingly plural. He's right that we usually have a constellation of thoughts, sensations, and emotions going on. But I think he's wrong when he claims that static representations of, of life are just attempts to gain control over it. Like so many 19th century thinkers, Nietzsche reduces human action to an often malign and always utilitarian motivation. And in doing so, he does something quite silly. Humans always, everywhere, have been in relationship with the divine. Humans who, as their cave art and burial rituals, standing stones and trinkets show, held this relationship to be the most central thing in their lives. But Nietzsche ignores this fact. In contradiction of the evidence, he imagines the natural human as godless, only later inventing religion as one more metaphysical move to control life. Because he ignores the evidence, his capacity to understand humans is always limited and incomplete, and with it, his capacity to understand the representations of reality which humans have always made. You see, fixing a single moment in time doesn't simply let us understand and control it, it allows us to appreciate it in a way that is often impossible while we're living through it. In life, moments are always past. They are gone as soon as they arrive. We can't pause in them and fully appreciate them. And this is what Nietzsche misses. Think about cave paintings. Are these attempts to gain control over life and dominate it? Possibly. But I think it's more likely that they seek to capture moments of sheer joy and exhilaration. The moment of the kill, the moment of the feast. These are moments that are drowned by adrenaline when they happen. They are not usually represented on cave walls as models that can be reflected on with fear or trembling, but rather with delight and joy. And that word joy is why this process is especially meaningful for the theologian. For Hildegard of Bingen, the difference between happiness and joy is that joy is a happiness that yearns to give thanks. 
harvest festivals emerged because our happiness often comes with a sense of appreciation appreciation to god for the goodness of creation and this perhaps is what photography can do photography can capture a moment in creation a moment of beauty a moment that can lead to joy it can encourage or delight in and thanks for creation by fixing us in its beauty and its wonder this is something that the great theologian Karl Barth perhaps misses a little. Being a modern, Barth thinks about knowledge in terms of information, and so he despises something called the analogia entis, or the analogy of being, where people seek to know God through God's creation. Barth rightly realizes that God is so far beyond the beauty of the world that what we see in the world cannot even when infinitely multiplied, cause us to gain information about God. But it can, I believe, cause us to know God. Know God in the sense of love him, in the sense of give thanks to him, in the sense of take delight in his creation, in the sense of praise him and delight in him. And this is what Nietzsche doesn't understand. This is what it is to be human. This is what humans are for. Humans are a species through which creation can give thanks to God for being. We are for this giving thanks. We are for praise and worship and delight. While yes, for sure, human representation of the world can help us understand it, so much art from cave paintings on has been religious. It has, involved, it has involved capturing a brief moment in creation in order to delight in it, and thereby to delight in, and indeed thank, the source of creation. Nietzsche, like so many 19th century figures, seemed to forget that to know what something is for is not primarily to note its similarity with other things. Like countless other objects, a cup can be used to, to kill a fly, or to hammer a nail, or, if it's shiny, to spot a reflection in it. But to know what something is for is to focus not on what it shares with different things, but to know what is unique to it. Yes, humans, like all creatures, seek to survive, to replicate, to build shelter, and to seek food. But unlike other creatures, we reflect on creation in such a way as to praise its creator. Yes, we too kill flies and hit nails and spot our reflection just like other animals. But unlike them, we seem to give thanks to God, who we praise on wall and stone and canvas page. We delight in creation in such a way as to thank its creator and to long for union with him. We are creation's priests, and creation, through us, give thanks to God and delights in him. Our art and representations, or signs and metaphysics, are unusual not because of their practical significance, but because of their fixation on theological things. To understand them, as Nietzsche forgot, is not simply to know what is common between them and other forms of animal expression, but to know what is different and what is unique. Photography is many things. Like all art, it can and does capture moments, eliciting reflection and driving change. This, this is good. Through photography, we can reflect on life and identify horrors that we need to change. But it's also a savoring of creation. It's the capturing of a moment in creation, which we can then turn to and delight in. A delight that we can isolate in so much as is possible from the noise and sensations and fears and thoughts that throb through our rapid movement through the world. And in this isolation, we can see the beauty 
the time can veil. So revealed, we can delight in and give thanks to the Creator. It is in this that photography, like all truly human activities, finds its theological dimension.